Introduction of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865 to 1948. Introduction. The aesthetic is dedicated by the author to the memory of his parents, Pasquale and Luisa Sipari, and of his sister Maria. Note. I give here a close translation of the complete Theory of Aesthetic, and in the historical summary, with the consent of the author, an abbreviation of the historical portion of the original work. Introduction There are always Americas to be discovered, the most interesting in Europe. I can lay no claim to having discovered an America, but I do claim to have discovered a Columbus. His name is Benedetto Croce, and he dwells on the shores of the Mediterranean at Naples, city of the antique Parthenope. Croce's America cannot be expressed in geographical terms. It is more important than any space of mountain and river, of forest and dale. It belongs to the kingdom of the spirit, and has many provinces. That province which most interests me, I have striven in the following pages to annex to the possessions of the Anglo-Saxon race, an act which cannot be blamed as predatory, since it may be said of philosophy more truly than of love that to divide is not to take away the historical summary will show how many a brave adventurer has navigated the perilous seas of speculation upon art how aristotle's marvellous insight gave him glimpses of its beauty how plato threw away its golden fruit how baumgarten sounded the depths of its waters Kant sailed along its coast without landing, and Vico hoisted the Italian flag upon its shore. But Benedetto Croce has been the first thoroughly to explore it, cutting his way inland through the tangled undergrowth of imperfect thought. He has measured its length and breadth, marked out and described its spiritual features with minute accuracy. The country thus won to philosophy will always bear his name, Estetica di Croce, a new America. It was at Naples in the winter of 1907 that I first saw the philosopher of aesthetic. Benedetto Croce, although born in the Abruzzi, province of Aquila, in 1866, is essentially a Neapolitan, and rarely remains long absent from the city on the shore of that magical sea where once Ulysses sailed, and where sometimes yet, near Amalfi, we may hear the sirens sing their song. But more wonderful than the song of any siren seems to me the theory of aesthetic as the science of expression, and that is why I have overcome the obstacles that stood between me and the giving of this theory, which, in my belief is the truth, to the English-speaking world. No one could have been further removed than myself, as I turned over at Naples the pages of La Critica, from any idea that I was nearing the solution of the problem of art. All my youth it had haunted me. As an undergraduate at Oxford, I had caught the exquisite cadence of Walter Pater's speech, as it came from his very lips, or rose like the perfume of some exotic flower from the ribbed pages of the Renaissance. Seeming to solve the riddle of the Sphinx, he solved it not, only delighted with pure pleasure of poetry and of subtle thought as he led one along the pathways of his enchanted garden, where I shall always love to tread. Oscar Wilde, too, I had often heard at his best, the most brilliant talker of our time, his wit flashing in the spring sunlight of Oxford luncheon parties, as now in his beautiful writings like the jewelled rapier of Mercutio. But his works, too, will be searched in vain by the seeker after definite aesthetic truth. 
With A. C. Swinburne I had sat and watched the lava that yet flowed from those lips that were kissed in youth by all the muses. Neither from him, nor from J. M. Whistler's brilliant aphorisms on art, could be gathered anything more than the exquisite pleasure of the moment, the monochronous hedone. Of the great pedagogues I had known, but never sat at the feet of Joet, whom I found far less inspiring than any of the great men above mentioned. Among the dead I had studied Herbert Spencer and Matthew Arnold, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Gaio. I had conversed with that living Neo-Latin Anatole France, the modern Rousseau, and had enjoyed the marvellous irony and eloquence of his writings, which, while they delight the society in which he lives, may well be one of the causes that lead to its eventual destruction. The solution of the problem of aesthetic is not in the gift of the muses. To return to Naples, as I looked over those pages of the bound volumes of La Critica, I soon became aware that I was in the presence of a mind far above the ordinary level of literary criticism. The profound studies of Carducci, of D'Annunzio, and of Pascoli, to name but three, in which those writers passed before me in all their strength and in all their weakness, led me to devote several days to the Critica. At the end of that time I was convinced that I had made a discovery, and wrote to the philosopher, who owns and edits that journal. In response to his invitation, I made my way on a sunny day in November, past the little shops of the coral vendors that surround like a necklace the Rione della Bellezza, and wound zigzag along the overcrowded Toledo. I knew that Signor Croce lived in the old part of town, but had hardly anticipated so remarkable a change as I experienced on passing beneath the great archway and finding myself in old Naples. This has already been described elsewhere, and I will not here dilate upon this world within a world, having so much of greater interest to tell in a brief space. I will merely say that the costumes here seemed more picturesque, the dark eyes flashed more dangerously than elsewhere. There was a quaint life, an animation about the streets, different from anything I had known before. As I climbed the lofty stone steps of the palazzo to the floor where dwells the philosopher of aesthetic, I felt as though I had stumbled into the eighteenth century, and were calling on Giambattisto Vico. After a brief inspection by a young man with the appearance of a secretary, I was told that I was expected, and admitted into a small room opening out of the hall. Thence, after a few moments waiting, I was led into a much larger room. The walls were lined all round with bookcases, barred and numbered, filled with volumes forming part of the philosopher's great library. I had not long to wait. A door opened behind me on my left, and a rather short, thick-set man advanced to greet me, and pronouncing my name at the same time with a slight foreign accent, asked me to be seated beside him. After the interchange of a few brief formulae of politeness in French, our conversation was carried on in Italian, and I had a better opportunity of studying my host's air and manner. His hands he held clasped before him, but frequently released them, to make those vivid gestures with which Neapolitans frequently clinch their phrase. His most remarkable feature was his eyes, of a greenish grey, extraordinary eyes, not for beauty, but for their fathomless depth, and for the sympathy which one felt welling up in them from the soul beneath. This was especially noticeable, as our conversation fell upon the question of art, and upon the many problems bound up with it. I do not know how long that first interview lasted, but it seemed a few minutes only, during which was displayed before me a vast panorama of unknown height and headland, of league upon league of forest, with its bright-winged birds of thought flying from tree to tree down the long avenues into the dim blue vistas of the unknown. I returned with my brain a-whirl, as though I had been in fairyland, and when I looked at the second edition of the Aesthetica, with his inscription, I was sure of it. 
these lines will suffice to show how the translation of the aesthetica originated from the acquaintance thus formed which has developed into friendship i will now make brief mention of benedetta croce's other work especially in so far as it throws light upon the aesthetic for this purpose besides articles in italian and german reviews i have made use of the excellent monograph on the philosopher by g prezzolini first then it will be well to point out that the aesthetic forms part of a complete philosophical system to which the author gives the general title of philosophy of the spirit the aesthetic is the first of the three volumes the second is the logic the third the philosophy of the practical in the logic as elsewhere in the system croce combats that false conception by which natural science in the shape of psychology makes claim to philosophy and formal logic to absolute value the thesis of the pure concept cannot be discussed here it is connected with the logic of evolution as discovered by hegel and is the only logic which contains in itself the interpretation and the continuity of reality bergson in his l'evolution creatrice deals with logic in a somewhat similar manner i recently heard him lecture on the distinction between spirit and matter at the collage de france and those who read french and italian will find that both croce's logic and the book above mentioned by the french philosopher will amply repay their labour the conception of nature as something lying outside the spirit which informs it as the non-being which aspires to being underlies all croce's thought and we find constant reference to it throughout his philosophical system with regard to the third volume the philosophy of the practical it is impossible here to give more than a hint of its treasures i merely refer in passing to the treatment of the will which is posited as a unity inseparable from the volitional act for croce there is no difference between action and intention means and end they are one thing inseparable as the intuition expression of aesthetic the philosophy of the practical is a logic and science of the will not a normative science just as in aesthetic the individuality of expression made models and rules impossible so in practical life the individuality of action removes the possibility of catalogues of virtues of the exact application of laws of the existence of practical judgments and judgments of value previous to action the reader will probably ask here but what then becomes of morality the question will be found answered in the theory of aesthetic and i will merely say here that croce's thesis of the double degree of the practical activity economic and moral is one of the greatest contributions to modern thought just as it is proved in the theory of aesthetic that the concept depends upon the intuition which is the first degree the primary and indispensable thing so it is proved in the philosophy of the practical that morality or ethic depends upon economic which is the first degree of the practical activity the volitional act is always economic but true freedom of the will exists and consists in conforming not merely to economic but to moral conditions to the human spirit which is greater than any individual here we are face to face with the ethics of christianity to which croce accords all honour this philosophy of the spirit is symptomatic of the happy reaction of the twentieth century against the crude materialism of the second half of the nineteenth it is the spirit which gives to the work of art its value not this or that method of arrangement this or that tint or cadence which can always be copied by skilful plagiarists not so the spirit of the creator 
in england we hear too much of natural science which has usurped the very name of philosophy the natural sciences are very well in their place but discoveries such as aviation are of infinitely less importance to the race than the smallest addition to the philosophy of the spirit empirical science with the collusion of positivism has stolen the cloak of philosophy and must be made to give it back among crochet's other important contributions to thought must be mentioned his definition of history as being aesthetic and differing from art solely in that history represents the real art the possible in connection with this definition and its proof the philosopher recounts how he used to hold an opposite view doing everything thoroughly he had prepared and written out a long disquisition on this thesis which was already in type when suddenly from the midst of his meditations the truth flashed upon him he saw for the first time clearly that history cannot be a science since like art it always deals with the particular without a moment's hesitation he hastened to the printers and bade them break up the type this incident is illustrative of the sincerity and good faith of benedetto croce one knows him to be severe for the faults and weaknesses of others merciless for his own yet though severe the editor of la critica is uncompromisingly just and would never allow personal dislike or jealousy or any extrinsic consideration to stand in the way of fair treatment to the writer concerned many superficial english critics might benefit considerably by attention to this quality in one who is in other respects also so immeasurably their superior a good instance of this impartiality is his critique of schopenhauer with whose system he is in complete disagreement yet affords him full credit for what of truth is contained in his voluminous writings croce's education was largely completed in germany and on account of their thoroughness he has always been an upholder of german methods one of his complaints against the italian positivists is that they only read second-rate works in french or at the most the dilettante booklets published in such profusion by the anglo-saxon press this tendency towards german thought especially in philosophy depends upon the fact of the former undoubted supremacy of germany in that field but croce does not for a moment admit the inferiority of the neo-latin races and adds with homely humour in reference to germany that we must not throw away the baby with the bath-water close arduous study and clear thought are the only key to scientific philosophical truth and crochet never begins an article for a newspaper without the complete collection of the works of the author to be criticized and his own elaborate notes on the table before him schopenhauer said there were three kinds of writers those who write without thinking the great majority those who think while they write not very numerous those who write after they have thought very rare croce certainly belongs to the last division and as i have said always feeds his thought upon complete erudition the bibliography of the works consulted for the estetica alone as printed at the end of the italian edition extends to many pages and contains references to works in any way dealing with the subject in all the european languages for instance croce has studied mr b bozanquet's eclectic works on aesthetic largely based upon german sources and by no means without value but he takes exception to mr bozanquet's statement that he has consulted all works of importance on the subject of aesthetic as a matter of fact mr bozanquet reveals his ignorance of the greater part of the contribution to aesthetic made by the neo-latin races which the reader of this book will recognize as of first-rate importance 
this thoroughness it is which gives such importance to the literary and philosophical criticisms of la critica croce's method is always historical and his object in approaching any work of art is to classify the spirit of its author as expressed in that work there are he maintains but two things to be considered in criticizing a book these are firstly what is its peculiarity in what way is it singular how is it differentiated from other works secondly what is its degree of purity that is to what extent has its author kept himself free from all considerations alien to the perfection of the work as an expression as a lyrical intuition with the answering of these questions croce is satisfied he does not care to know if the author kept a motor-car like maeterlinck or prefer to walk on putney heath like swinburne this amounts to saying that all works of art must be judged by their own standard. How far has the author succeeded in doing what he intended? Croce is far above any personal animus, although the same cannot be said of those he criticizes. These, like D'Annunzio, whose limitations he points out, his egoism, his lack of human sympathy, are often very bitter, and accuse the penetrating critic of want of courtesy. This seriousness of purpose runs like a golden thread through all Croce's work. The flimsy superficial remarks on poetry and fiction, which too often pass for criticism in England, Scotland is a good deal more thorough, are put to shame by La Critica, the study of which I commend to all readers who read or wish to read Italian they will find in its back numbers a complete picture of a century of italian literature besides a storehouse of philosophical criticism the quarterly and edinburgh reviews are our only journals which can be compared to la critica and they are less exhaustive on the philosophical side we should have to add to these mind and the hibbert journal to get even an approximation to the scope of the italian review as regards croce's general philosophical position it is important to understand that he is not a hegelian in the sense of being a close follower of that philosopher one of his last works is that in which he deals in a masterly manner with the philosophy of hegel the title may be translated what is living and what is dead of the philosophy of hegel here he explains to us the hegelian system more clearly than that wondrous edifice was ever before explained and we realize at the same time that croce is quite as independent of hegel as of kant of vico as of spinoza of course he has made use of the best of hegel just as every thinker makes use of his predecessors, and is in his turn made use of by those that follow him. But it is incorrect to accuse of Hegelianism the author of an anti-Hegelian aesthetic, of a logic where Hegel is only half accepted, and of a philosophy of the practical, which contains hardly a trace of Hegel. I give an instance. If the great conquest of Hegel be the dialectic of opposites his great mistake lies in the confusion of opposites with things which are distinct but not opposite if says croce we take as an example the application of the hegelian triad that formulates becoming affirmation negation and synthesis we find it applicable for those opposites which are true and false good and evil being and not being, but not applicable to things which are distinct but not opposite, such as art and philosophy, beauty and truth, the useful and the moral. These confusions led Hegel to talk of the death of art, to conceive as possible a philosophy of history, and to the application of the natural sciences to the absurd task of constructing a philosophy of nature. Croce has cleared away these difficulties 
by shewing that if from the meeting of opposites must arise a superior synthesis, such a synthesis cannot arise from things which are distinct but not opposite, since the former are connected together as superior and inferior, and the inferior can exist without the superior, but not vice versa. Thus we see how philosophy cannot exist without art, while art, occupying the lower place, can and does exist without philosophy. This brief example reveals Croce's independence in dealing with Hegelian problems. I know of no philosopher more generous than Croce in praise and elucidation of other workers in the same field, past and present. For instance, and apart from Hegel, Kant has to thank him for drawing attention to the marvellous excellence of the critique of judgment, generally neglected in favour of the critiques of pure reason and of practical judgment. Baumgarten for drawing the attention of the world to his obscure name, and for reprinting his Latin thesis in which the word aesthetic occurs for the first time. And Schleiermacher, for the tributes paid to his neglected genius in the history of aesthetic. La Critica, too, is full of generous appreciation of contemporaries by Crochet and by that profound thinker, Gentile. But it is not only philosophers who have reason to be grateful to Crochet for his untiring zeal and diligence. Historians, economists, poets, actors, and writers of fiction have been rescued from their undeserved limbo by this valiant Red Cross Knight, and now shine with due brilliance in the circle of their peers. It must also be admitted that a large number of false lights, popular will-o'-the-wisps, have been ruthlessly extinguished with the same breath. For instance, Karl Marx, the socialist theorist and agitator, finds in Croce an exponent of his views, in so far as they are based upon the truth, but where he blunders, his critic immediately reveals the origin and nature of his mistakes. Croce's studies in economic are chiefly represented by his work, the title of which may be translated Historical Materialism and Marxist Economic. To indicate the breadth and variety of Croce's work, I will mention the further monograph on the 16th century Neapolitan Pulcinella, the original of our punch and the personage of the Neapolitan in comedy, a monument of erudition and of accurate and lively dramatic criticism that would alone have occupied an ordinary man's activity for half a lifetime. One must remember, however, that Croce's average working day is of ten hours. His interest is concentrated on things of the mind, and although he sits on several royal commissions, such as those of the archives of all Italy, and of the monuments to King Victor Emmanuel, he has taken no university degree, and much dislikes any affectation of academic superiority. He is ready to meet any one on equal terms, and try with them to get at the truth of any subject, be it historical, literary, or philosophical. Truth, he says, is democratic, and I can testify that the search for it in his company is very stimulating. As is well said by Prezzolini, he has a new word for all. There can be no doubt of the great value of Croce's work as an educative influence, and if we are to judge of a philosophical system by its action on others, then we must place the philosophy of the spirit very high. It may be said, with perfect truth, that since the death of the poet Carducci, there has been no influence in Italy to compare with that of Benedetto Croce. His dislike of academies and of all forms of prejudice runs parallel with his breadth and sympathy with all forms of thought. His activity in the present is only equalled by his reverence for the past. Naples he loves with the blind love of the child for its parent, and he has been of notable assistance to such Neapolitan talent as is manifested in the works of Salvatore di Giacomo, whose best poems are written in the dialect of Naples, 
or rather in a dialect of his own, which Croce has difficulty in persuading the author always to retain. The original jet of inspiration, having been in dialect, it is clear that to amend this inspiration at the suggestion of wiseacres at the café would have been to ruin it altogether. Of the popularity that his system and teaching have already attained, we may judge by the fact that the aesthetic, despite the difficulty of the subject, is already in its third edition in Italy, where, owing to its influence, philosophy sells better than fiction, while the French and Germans, not to mention the Czechs, have long had translations of the earlier editions. His logic is on the point of appearing in its second edition, and I have no doubt that the philosophy of the practical will eventually equal these works in popularity. The importance and value of Italian thought have been too long neglected in Great Britain. Where, as in Benedetto Croce, we get the clarity of vision of the Latin, joined to the thoroughness and erudition of the best German tradition, we have a combination of rarer power and effectiveness, which can by no means be neglected. The philosopher feels that he has a great mission, which is nothing less than the leading back of thought to belief in the spirit, deserted by so many for crude empiricism and positivism. His view of philosophy is that it sums up all the higher human activities, including religion, and that in proper hands it is able to solve any problem. But there is no finality about problems. The solution of one leads to the posing of another, and so on. Man is the maker of life, and his spirit ever proceeds from a lower to a higher perfection. Connected with this view of life is Croce's dislike of modernism. When once a problem has been correctly solved, it is absurd to return to the same problem. Roman Catholicism cannot march with the times. It can only exist by being conservative. Its only logic is to be illogical. Therefore, Croce is opposed to Loisy and Neo-Catholicism, and supports the encyclical against modernism. The Catholic religion, with its great stores of myth and morality, which for many centuries was the best thing in the world, is still there for those who are unable to assimilate other food. Another instance of his dislike for modernism is his criticism of Pascoli, whose attempts to reveal enigmas in the writings of Dante he looks upon as useless. We do not, he says, read Dante in the twentieth century for his hidden meanings, but for his revealed poetry. I believe that Croce will one day be recognized as one of the very few great teachers of humanity. At present he is not appreciated at nearly his full value. One rises from a study of his philosophy with a sense of having been all the time, as it were, in personal touch with the truth, which is very far from the case after the perusal of certain other philosophies. Croce has been called the philosopher-poet, and if we take philosophy as Novalis understood it, certainly Croce does belong to the poets, though not to the formal category of those who write in verse. Croce is at any rate a born philosopher, and as every trade tends to make its object prosaic, so does every vocation tend to make it poetic. Yet no one has toiled more earnestly than Croce. Thorough might well be his motto, and if today he is admitted to be a classic without the stiffness one connects with that term, be sure he has well merited the designation. His name stands for the best that Italy has to give the world, of serious, stimulating thought. I know nothing to equal it elsewhere." Secure in his strength, Croce will often introduce a joke or some amusing illustration from contemporary life, in the midst of a most profound and serious argument. This spirit of mirth is a sign of superiority. He who is not sure of himself can spare no energy for the making of mirth. Croce loves to laugh at his enemies and with his friends. So the philosopher of Naples sits by the blue gulf and explains the universe to those who have ears to hear. One can philosophize anywhere, he says. 
but he remains significantly at Naples. Thus I conclude these brief remarks upon the author of The Aesthetic, confident that those who give time and attention to its study will be grateful for having placed in their hands this pearl of great price from the diadem of the antique Parthenope. Douglas Ainsley The Athenaeum, Pall Mall, May 1909 End of Introduction Recording by Lisa Reichert